the vital role state legislation plays in the battle of ideas and the protection of life. We'll explore that and more on today's edition of Life Matters. Brian Johnston is the Western Director of the National Right to Life Committee. He has served in many capacities while advocating for innocent lives. As California Commissioner on Aging, as Chairman of the California Pro-Life Council, on the board of the National Legal Center for the Medically Dependent and Disabled. And now here's our host, Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. We're your program on the right to life, on what it really is. You see, it's much more than our feelings about abortion. It's much more than how much we want to care for babies. And those are good things. The right to life is actually part of the battle of ideas because it's a very specific idea that appears in our founding documents, the founding documents of this nation, which is a unique nation because it's built on ideas. And the right to life is an assertion about your life and my life and about every individual's life, that it's a gift not from the government. Your life is a gift from God, but the government does have a responsibility protecting your right to be alive. And if the government fails to do that, it's an unjust government. For this reason, governments are instituted among men, says the founders, to ensure these rights. So if the right to life isn't being insured, there's something wrong with our government. It's not following its promises. Today is a special day, September 11th of 2021. We know it's an anniversary, but it's also, for California, the very last day we can broadcast before the recall election of Governor Gavin Newsom. If you've been listening to Life Matters, you know that for California, the chief executive of California, Gavin Newsom, is the single most pro-death, and I mean that in terms of public policy, not just philosophy, but his policy is ensuring the right to kill vulnerable human beings, both human babies in the womb, he's invited mothers from throughout the nation to come and kill their babies in California, and the California taxpayers will pay for that. But beyond that, he's also embraced killing the elderly and sick in the name of compassion, assisted suicide, and he himself engaged in the killing because that's what it is. You're not letting someone die. You're not helping them as they die. You're ensuring that they're dead by bringing deadly, lethal action against them. That's what assisted suicide is. He participated in the killing of his mother before assisted suicide was even legalized. And you can look that up. Go ahead and Google it. There have been several articles written about it. He wrote about it. But the fact is he admitted, as most assisted suicide advocates will admit, he admitted he was uncomfortable with his mother's illness. He was actually alienated from his mother and didn't want to visit her. But Gavin Newsom, when he got the call, decided, oh, if you want to kill yourself, I'll be there, Mom. So he is supporting the use of killing as a social tool, as a law. And this is critically important in understanding what the right to life is. This recall election is critically important. And I want to spend a little time right now. If you haven't, go back in our podcasts. And we've been talking about this now for the last month. Recall elections are very different than typical elections. If you're going to recall a governor, the first question is, should he or she be recalled? So on the ballot, the first question is, should Gavin Newsom be recalled? If the majority of California voters say yes, then he will be recalled. If we don't reach 50% plus one, if we don't go over a majority, which has to be over 50%, it's irrelevant who wants to replace him. It doesn't matter how many votes they get. The first goal, therefore, must be to ensure that we get to 50% plus one. So in today's program, we're going to hear from yet another candidate. I want you to know there is a leading candidate, and California Pro-Life Council has not endorsed a particular replacement. We just want a replacement. And so because the goal is to get a majority of voters voting yes, there are other pro-life candidates that you can find out about. And we urge you to vote yes on the recall if you're a California voter, and pick the candidate you like. There's 14 pro-life candidates. We've interviewed many of them, and at the end of this program, you're going to hear from another one, Jenny Ray LaRue, a businesswoman from Northern California, a very capable woman. I think you'll like her. But the reason we're doing that is if you don't like the front runner, don't worry. Get involved in the process. Vote yes. 
And that's what's going to ensure the recall. The other part of this program is we're going to deal with an important news item. And as you already know, the media is lying about the abortion issue. The media is intellectually dishonest and has taken an ideological position on abortion. And they don't tell you all the facts. That's come up yet again with the Texas law. The state of Texas passed a law and it's been in the news lately. But they're lying about both the law and they're lying about what it means for the Supreme Court and the nation. Now, if you've read my book, here's a shameless plug. I've written about Roe v. Wade and Doe versus Bolton. The media has lied about Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton. If you haven't heard of Doe v. Bolton, it's because the media doesn't want you knowing about it. There were two decisions in 1973 on January 22nd. And when we come back, we're going to go in depth on what really happened in Texas and what the Texas law really does. Right now, the media is losing its mind, saying that Roe v. Wade is overturned, saying that the Texas law, literally Joe Biden said he's going to use every element of the government. Let me get his quote. He is launching a whole government effort to respond to the law. He's tasking the Department of Health and Human Services and the Justice Department to see what steps the federal government can take to ensure that women in Texas have access to safe and legal abortions. They're going to run it from the White House. But you already know this, that the dominant media is the servant of the abortion ideology. And they're pushing hard a false narrative once again. So when we come back, I'm going to fill you in on what's really happened in Texas, why you should not embrace the alarmism or even get into a debate regarding Texas, because the Texas law isn't nearly as significant as the media is making it. They're trying to gin up opposition, and literally here in California, they're trying to use it to justify why they have to keep Gavin Newsom. So there's a lot of deceit out there. You're listening to Life Matters. One of our purposes is to bring you the facts of life, the real facts that have been suppressed by a dominant media culture, committed to using medicine to kill babies and also now using medicine to kill other vulnerable people. Critically important that you understand this battle as we get into it. We'll be right back right after this. Life Matters continues after this. This is Brian Johnston of California Pro-Life and Life Matters Radio with an urgent California action alert. The state assembly, where you have a representative, the state assembly is now considering Senate Bill 380, which would remove safeguards regarding assisted suicide. There need be no psychological counseling offered before these people are given a lethal dose. The reality is that without any safeguards, many people in nursing homes, COVID patients, you think of it, those with serious illnesses will be at immediate risk. Senate Bill 380 must be opposed. Please contact your state assembly member in Sacramento. Urge them to vote no on SB 380. That's the state assembly. Urge them to vote no on SB 380. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. We're examining several things. I want to remind you we're in the midst of a recall election. Make sure that you do vote. If you want to go back on our podcasts, go to lifematters.life and you can hear all about this recall. There is a leading candidate that if you don't like him, he's pro-life. But if for some other reason you don't like him, there are other pro-life candidates. Make sure that you do vote yes on the recall and vote for the pro-life candidate that you do like. We must get to a majority of yes votes on this recall. Right now, we're going to take up a breaking news item that the media has intentionally lied about. It's a law that was passed in Texas. It's a very interesting law, and I won't go into a lot of details, but basically, it asserts that if there's a human heartbeat present, that you not kill that baby. Well, that's a pretty cool idea, because if there's a beating heart, that is always defined whether someone is alive or dead in the eyes of the law. When did their heart stop is actually an important question that's used in hospitals and morgues to determine the time of death. So this is an intriguing law. Another aspect of it is it allows for civil action, not just state action. Again, read my book, Evil Twins, Roe and Doe, How the Supreme Court Unleashed Medical Killing. We talk about what Roe and Doe did. Again, these are twin decisions. 
you've only been told by the media about Roe v. Wade, but it's conjoined with Doe versus Bolton. The fact is, is that these decisions address the state government's right to control abortion or take action. They don't comment on an individual's right. And I assure you that other individuals are harmed by abortion. For example, in Texas, that law, as it is allowed to take effect, is written such that a husband can sue an abortionist for killing his baby. It's written such that other individuals that have and should have concern about that child would have civil standing in civil court to sue that abortionist. I'm actually kind of inclined towards that. I think that's an important aspect of the law, if you're familiar with the law and a tortious act. But killing one of your relatives is a pretty serious implication, your child. And you and I know that it isn't just the mother, the, the father is a parent. So this is an interesting law, but I want to explain to you what happened. As soon as this law was signed by Governor Abbott of Texas, pro-abortion forces appealed to the Supreme Court immediately to enjoin it. Don't let it go into effect. The Supreme Court, in looking at it, basically came to a valid conclusion, not based on the law, but based on their procedure. If you're familiar with how the high court works, the high court deals with issues that lower courts haven't resolved. And it's very important to recognize that's what the Supreme Court dealt with in responding to the request to stop enforcement of SB 8. That was the bill in Texas. The Supreme Court did not rule on the law's constitutionality. Quote, we cannot say the applicants have met their burden to prevail in an injunction or stay application. That means to stop the law. Five of the justices agreed in that decision. I continue. In reaching this conclusion, we stress that we do not purport to resolve definitely any jurisdictional or substantive claim in the applicant's lawsuit. Their application also presents complex and novel antecedent procedural questions on which they have not carried their burden. In other words, the way the Supreme Court works, if a state passes a law and someone doesn't like that law, it's appealed to the state courts. Stop the law. So in California, it would go to the California courts and then it would be appealed up to the California Supreme Court. If, however, they didn't like that, they then can bring it to the federal courts and go into the federal appeals system. And that's how cases come to the Supreme Court. When lower courts have not resolved a question, then the Supreme Court will take a look at it to see if it is truly constitutional. These people wanted to bypass it entirely. When the Supreme Court said, you don't understand, this isn't the time to bring it to us. They pretended that the Supreme Court had ruled on it. The Supreme Court did not uphold the Texas law. The Supreme Court said, this isn't the time to ask us. This isn't appropriate. This is not the right procedure to follow. Nevertheless, the media leapt on this and are telling you, and particularly their followers, because there are people who follow and believe the dominant media. So I want to remind you that the Texas law that you're hearing so much about, it's actually a molehill. They're making a mountain out of that molehill in order to gin up opposition. And on several levels, you're going to continue hearing this. They're going to demand right now that they pack the court. Oh, the Supreme Court, it's denying the constitutionality of Roe v. Wade. Well, Roe v. Wade was never in the Constitution. But they want to use this case to justify packing the Supreme Court. They're using this case now, the Texas case, to justify keeping Gavin Newsom in office. They're using this case to say all abortion is great. There should be no limits on abortion. It's just a right. It's just a choice. Don't think any deeper about the humanity of it. Just have the law enforce unlimited abortion and unlimited abortion funding. And come on, let's do it. Follow us. We're the path to freedom and to choice. And that's the mentality that they're ginning up in our culture. That's the media's job. And they're liars. They are actually fake news. So that's the real story on Texas. Don't allow people to get worked up about it. It isn't the great victory. Many pro-lifers have said, what a great victory. This is wonderful. And in some ways, there is, in fact, a silver lining because it indicates that five members of the court are not sold on the media's version of reality. But they're going to hear in the fall a case that's in some ways more significant because it's gone through the proper appellate channels. 
And that case has to do with the Mississippi Gestational Age Act, which says that at 15 weeks, they're going to prevent abortions after that. That particular law has gone through the Mississippi courts. It has gone through the federal courts and the courts of appeal. And that is on the Supreme Court's desk this fall. Now, that ruling will be of great significance. That ruling is important. So prepare for that because the Supreme Court's decisions are very important. But this decision regarding Texas isn't. And they're trying to use it to create alarmism. The sky is falling mentality so that they'll gin up their voters so that they can do many things, as I said, aside from packing the Supreme Court. At every level of government, they use deceit to try to get what they want. So be aware of the facts. When we come back, you're going to hear from Jenny Ray LaRue. Jenny Ray LaRue, as I mentioned, is one of several candidates. On our podcast, go back to the podcast at lifematters.life. You can hear from all of the candidates. You want to know who's pro-life. They're listed at californiaprolife.org. And we've been interviewing them here on Life Matters. And next, you're going to hear from Jenny Ray LaRue a very capable businesswoman running for governor. Life Matters continues after this. Do you hear that sound? That's the sound of a child's heart beating. It can be measured as early as 16 days after conception when mom, she may not even know she's pregnant yet. And yet that unique human life, that boy or girl, has his or her own blood supply, and circulatory system dependent on mom. The facts are on our side, and facts are terrible things to waste. California Pro-Life is dedicated to winning California back for life. For more information, go to californiaprolife.org. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, welcome to Life Matters, where you program on the right to life. And many of you are hearing this know already that we're in the midst of a campaign for a new governor. I want to briefly, before I introduce our our guest, I want to explain why the California Pro-Life Council PAC has not yet endorsed, and we may not even endorse. And so what you need to understand is mathematics. The more people who run and the more people who say we have to have a change in governance, as long as you get 50% plus one, then you get to replace them. So I want you to spend a little time today with Jenny Ray, and she's very much a pro-life individual. I think you're going to like Jenny Ray, and I want Jenny to talk to you about who she is and why she's running. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Look, here's the deal. I'm running for governor because I want to free California to live, work, and breathe again. And I am a data scientist. I'm a mom. I'm a business owner. And I'm a farmer. But probably most importantly, I'm a Californian, and I really love this state. Gavin Newsom has not been good for the state of California. When I look at the data, it tells a pretty clear story. People have left more than have come to the state for the first time in 170 years. Uh, we have businesses permanently closed. We have families that are desperate and our you know prices are too high. We can't afford to live. At the same time, he's living in a mansion, going to the French Laundry, and he was explaining how much venture capital we have in the state of California while we're talking about homelessness on our streets. And so uh, I'm a CEO of an experienced outsider. I'm a businesswoman. Uh, and what I do is I get into organizations and I make them grow. I fix them up and I send them on their way. And that's my passion for the state of California is to write the many crazy things that are happening inside the state, both from an operations and a policy standpoint. So I am really excited to be with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're so pleased to have you. Now, you had actually initiated contacting us and you had mentioned that you are ardently pro-life and you have a story. Do you want to relate that to folks? I'd love to. Well, I'm an Ivy League trained Bain consulting career woman. And so I've come across a lot of people that are on all parts of the pro-life, pro-choice spectrum throughout my life. And Mm -hmm. I've gained an understanding of some of the challenges as a really high performing working mom uh, that come to face a woman in our society in America today. And I deferred having children because I was concerned about being a good mom. Uh, My husband's greatest desire in all of life was that he would be a dad. And so we did decide to have kids uh, in uh, what I was in my early thirties. And um, after we had our first son, which the the first uh, one was a struggle for me, I was really battling with whether I could do the work that I love and Mm -hmm. home well. And I discovered that the lie that women have to choose between being good at one thing or good at another thing is not true. Um, That men have been 
active in business, active in communities, and great dads for a very long time. And uh, and I figured out really quickly that that was super possible. Um, but but then we we had a really big you know left turn for our family. We miscarried twice. And what was so shocking to me in those miscarriages, after having battled with the decision to have children in the first place, and then having gone through the process of having a, a child, loving having a child and wanting you know many more children at that point, uh, was the deep grief that came with miscarriage. And it kind of slapped me in the face. It was unexpected. Uh, and, and the thing that was the most surprising about it is that many people did not know how to participate in that grief. And what I recognized was how truly pro-choice even many pro-life people are, um, not recognizing that a, that a baby in the womb, uh, even before 12 weeks, which is when I, I miscarried one, seven weeks and 12 weeks, those uh, miscarriages are lives. Um, mm -hmm. and lives that are there to be grieved. So they were kind of of the mind of, oh, it's, it was a really early pregnancy. It's quite normal. Just get over it. And, and even then nobody said that directly after I passed two weeks of grieving, uh, they were just ready for me to be done. And, and I recognized culturally how important grief is to both recognize the sanctity of life and also um, for healing moms that have gone through abortions um, and moms that have lost babies through miscarriage or infant loss. So I've become a part of my active community and now part of this journey, a woman who loves to just share my grief story with other women. I invite them if they haven't grieved uh, to grieve, if they haven't named babies that they've lost in any way to do that. Um, and I believe that the power of grief is part of the healing process that will mm -hmm. bring us from a place in California where we abort over 200,000 babies a year uh, to a place where we recognize that that lie that I believed um, and the lies that many others believe that those aren't lies and we have to choose uh, between a full life and a baby are, are just not true. And I want to work actively as the governor of California to both carry that as a message and reflect that in a policy. Wonderful. Well, that's what I appreciate is that you understand the importance of civics in this battle at the laws. You know, we have doubled the per capita rate of abortion in California. So we're the largest state, but we have the high abortion rate because we pay with our tax money for those abortions. And for the industry to market in order to have an abortion, you need to have a pregnant woman. And in many ways, the woman is an indirect object in the abortionist task. They have to find a baby to kill. So that you need those pregnant women. But there's a bigger issue that we haven't had a chance to talk about. I know you filled out our questionnaire very well. And we're really concerned about the purpose of the law. And the purpose of the law is, in fact, to protect life. So when Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton came down, it did more than simply address the abortion issue. It actually addressed medical practice. And it was in Doe versus Bolton that the Supreme Court said, Doctors are to no longer follow the Hippocratic Oath. On January 21st of 73, doctors across this nation were obligated ethically to follow that oath, and in most states, obligated by the law to never kill a human baby. January 22nd, 73, the Supreme Court allowed abortion across the nation through, first of all, discarding the Hippocratic Oath and discarding medical ethics and gave explicit instructions for doctors to kill. That now is echoing through our culture. And doctors are killing other human beings for social reasons as well. It's become incredibly common. Do you want to address that? It's something that our current governor is an advocate of, and that is physician-assisted suicide and other forms of yeah. euthanasia. Yeah, look, I'm pro-life from birth until death. And so uh, I, I believe that the value of human life is... Uh, is, is downgraded, is, you know, is, is removed by these micro decisions um, that have macro consequences. And so I, I stand firmly in support of life from conception all the way till death. And I do believe that our policies need to reflect that as well. I'm concerned about doctors having the right, uh, but even more the responsibility um, to, to make those decisions on behalf of people. I'm concerned about that even more broadly than these two issues as well. That's right. It's very incisive. And particularly, we're starting to see that the substituted judgment of the medical professionals is often very dangerous if they are not following an oath to always care for their vulnerable patients. And so we've seen a dramatic change in medicine, and we're seeing it now. We're in a medical emergency, and certain things are going on that are questionable. It's because medical ethics were changed that day in 1973. Okay. 
Well, I want to well, go back really quickly, Brian, to one sure, thing please. you said before, just so that uh, folks know, you know, as a woman who is a career oriented woman, I have a lot of access to women across the ideological spectrum. And I just want to address one real key root issue that I find in a lot of different places. Um, and not that many women who are facing the decision whether to abort or not are really of how supportive uh, families, communities, and broader options are and will be for them. And I do think that we can do better outside of the government. You know, I think there are gaps in care for women right now. Yes for women that are um, low-income women, for women that are, are teen moms. And I just want to share a few of my ideas about how we can support women uh, with those options, um, not just for adoption, which has traditionally been one option that's been you know on the table for women, but actually for uh, keeping and raising their babies. Um, so one thing that's really kind of a crazy, potentially unintended consequence of the last year from remote school is that now we have the ability to offer remote high school completion to every teen mom in the state of California. That has not mm-hmm. been on the table before, but that's really exciting because now the narrative of you won't finish high school, you won't become anything uh, has you know a strike against it. And that's that's the kind of policy, that's the kind of planning uh, that's going to save lives in our state. In addition, um, I've discovered that there is a big gap in early childhood care. I'm really encouraging places of faith, churches, community centers to step up uh, with those kind of care options and care centers, especially in the zero to three age group. So if you haven't looked into your community options for that, you know, just imagine you, you were inviting a woman to keep her baby um, and thinking on her behalf about what she might need. I think there's more that we can do for that across the state. So they really are often left hopeless. And, and then finally, I think that there's a, a lot that's lacking in terms of the broader conversation about some of the consequences emotionally of having abortions that women will often go through grief. And that doesn't have to be uh, from a punishment perspective. We're not trying to gaslight people into making, you know, the right decision, but there are absolutely, you know, some really strong research about some super sad side effects for the mom, not just the loss of life of a baby. And so just to let people know, I've counseled women through this process and saved many lives, not all. Um, but as I've encouraged them, I found that having a plan and resources and hope for the future actually makes a really big difference for moms in your community. And that's something that everyone who's listening today can do. That's right. Well, Jenny Ray, very quickly, why don't you tell folks where they can find out more about you? You can find out about me on our website, JennyRayCA.com. We're also on all of the social channels at the handle Jenny Ray CA. That's J-E-N-N-Y-R-A-E-C-A. Uh, we also have an email address, hello at JennyRayCA.com. And if you want to reach out to us that way, we have a 24-hour response policy. So um, I have no special interest funding. So I would love to have your support, but also, um, you know, volunteer and folks that just have questions about what it means to be pro-life and happy, happy to answer those as a mom who has a unique voice in this race. See you soon. Thank you. We, We appreciate all that you do and thanks to everyone listening. Life Matters is a production of the California Pro-Life Council, the state affiliate of National Right to Life.